Okay, welcome back to the podcast. This is episode number 166 with my guest, Nicole Lise. Uh, Nikki is a composer, a DJ, who lives in uh, Canada. We met Nikki a couple years ago. Um, she, we did a project with her called um, Dystopian Suite. And then we did another project a few years later called White Label Experiment. White Label Experiment, excuse me. And uh, Nikki's writing is really amazing, really really unique. I don't know how to describe it. I really suggest that you listen to her music, but also look at her scores, um, the way that she puts things together and her drum set writing in particular, at least in my experience has been really interesting. So I hope you enjoy this podcast. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Nikki's great. So I hope you enjoy it. We'll talk to you soon. Without further ado, Nicole Lise. Take care. Bye. Nicole Lise, welcome to my podcast. I think um, we've been texting and emailing a bit about it since, I don't know, for a while, but you know, one thing leads to another, and uh, but we're here, and I have yeah. to get you to some some illegal celebrations um, with fireworks coming up. So I'll get you out of here as quickly as I can. But you're somebody that's been in the so sort of orbit. Um, you know, generally, I think about so's work with composers. I think about just the ecosystem that we traffic in on a daily basis. Um, predominantly has been American composers. I think it's because of the, you know being in New York. We work with people who are just, you know, right over the subway ride. You know, you can just get on the get on a tunnel and go see them, and that's been sort of our default. Um, but I think it was uh, was it ecstatic music? What was it that put well, up? No, it was something in Mata. In, it was Mata. the Mata, yes. yeah, that, that brought us together initially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that that was something also like our generation had this not our generation isn't responsible for it, but there was this sort of like push to pair different ensembles, whether it be like, you know, so percussion is going to open for flying Lotus or Nikki Lise, who is, you know, composer in your own right, but also kind of in the DJ world, you're going to write something for percussion quartet. You know, you've written for percussion before, but we've never met. Let's pair it together. Um, You come from a background that has influences of a lot of the same strains of influences that so percussion has, and we met, and you wrote this piece called, I think it was called Dystopian Suite, is that right? Dystopia Suite. Dystopia yeah. Suite, excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for Percussion Quartet, and it had some of the craziest drum set writing I think I've ever seen. <laughs> um, well, not not in terms of its difficulty, but just the way it was notated and the way it sounded was like this sort of like when you step back and squint at it, it it looks like a thing, but when you get into it, you're like, oh my God, there's so much little things happening in, there, right. in, in these little beats. So. Anyway, just so folks have an idea of, of what – that's just all sort of a little preface to give folks an idea of where So and Us met. But would you mind just sort of for me, because I don't actually know you as a composer that well, short of the stuff we've done together. Um, can you just give me a little bit of a like nickel and dime tour of Nikki Lise? Uh, do you go by Nikki or is it Nicole? Which do you prefer? Nikki. Call me Nikki. Nikki. All right. Just like where are you are from? What got you into doing what you're doing? And then we'll, t- we'll yeah. go from there. Yeah, sure. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean I – you know, listen to a lot of music from a really young age, everything. My parents had a huge record collection, but it was very specific genre and it it was easy listening and soundtracks. And so I was, I grew up around, and it's crazy. That stuff is crazy. I still listen to, you know, some of it because it's tripped out and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, I won't go into much detail about it, but it also makes genres in every way. Soundtracks, of course, from the time we're talking 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. It's okay to nerd out a little bit. I mean, things like like the Enoch Light Orchestra, like they are, they're sort of cheese ball a little bit, but if you're a nerd about this stuff and you're a nerd about like audiophile panning and audio imaging, it's like that stuff's really, really innovative and cool. It is. It is. So thank you for allowing me to nerd out because I will. I I, I just, the stuff, there was no really, um, it was, it was, it doesn't get the the credit it deserves much of it. And we're talking Mm -hmm. about things that, that do like Burt Bacharach and stuff that I really think is incredible stuff, the orchestration and things like that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the soundtracks and stuff I was listening to, and you listen to that with headphones and there's like, there's a high pitched women's choir doubling strings in the corner. And there's, you know, the, the, the reverb, which is just saturated, but maybe not in this year. And then there's a drum kit over there that changes tempo. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy stuff. So I grew up with that, but also started listening to, I also grew up, my dad collects and, and works and sells and, and uh, fixes electronic equipment. So, and never, maybe we've talked about this a little bit, but never threw any of it away. No, and that I mean, was- 
I wish I would have known that about you. Like, I wish you would have been like, hi, I'm Nikki and my dad yeah. repaired electronic equipment. Like, I feel like I would have, everything you've done would have made way more sense to me just up front. Uh, like a label? <laughs> hi, well, my dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, we have buttons for the pronouns, but we also have buttons for like what our parents did for a living, you know, yeah, just to be like, why not? like, let's get everybody on the same page here because when I look at your setup, it is not. Yes, there's DJ equipment. There's, you know, there's maybe a laptop or something, but like it's all pretty analog stuff and it's all taped together. And I yeah, can tell right. that you've sort of taken it apart and maybe rewired some things like, you know. Yeah, it, that's that's totally it, because everything I grew up around much of that period of, of time was there was a lot of progress, but a lot of things people it was great. People were were inventing things and trying things, but many things didn't work. And my dad was sort of a beta tester for that. Mm -hmm. And he would get all of this stuff. And much of it didn't work or it would work for a period of time, but it was analog. So it wouldn't die. It wasn't like digital where it would go from, you know, one to zero. Would, you know, it was a purgatory state, a state that it was, I was like calling it it's, the state of purgatory. I don't mean to interrupt you, but it is, it's yeah. something that I think didn't dawn on me that like analog stuff didn't decay in the way that digital stuff does decay. Like, um, uh, I learned about this with so percussion because we were doing a piece where we were all using a timer and Eric was using a super old iPod and over the course of a minute, it would lose five seconds, but we didn't know. And we were doing this piece that was like 12 minutes long. And by the end, Eric is like playing for two more minutes longer than everybody else. We're like, what the hell are you doing? Uh, analog is so, it's so sweet. But it's because there's literally a rock, a quartz inside of that, that is managing the time. And that stuff decays slowly over time. Exactly. And yeah. it's just like, Oh, it's like, I don't know, like that, that idea, I think is just something that people need to realize is happening when you're looking at a guitar pedal versus uh, a plug-in, say, for yeah, example, you know. For sure. And, and that was the beauty of it. It's still to the, very much to this day, even more, I have an emotional attachment to many of those machines. I mean, a lot mm -hmm. of care was taken. Some of them had wood paneling, you know, they were beautiful to look at. And so they were no longer useful in the, in the mm. sense they didn't follow the manual. And so they were just rejected and put in a landfill or whatever, but not at my house. We, we kept those and I would, because they made such great sounds um, and visuals, I, they were instruments to me. So I grew up around a lot of malfunction, a lot of you know, things that didn't. But you need to put that on a shirt. I grew up around a lot of malfunction. Another button, <laughs> right? Yeah. Awesome. But it and, and that just informed the way I I think and feel and 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 think about music and time and rhythm. So, um, and then you know, gradually I started listening to a lot of music. One of the machines that my dad got was a, a satellite dish in the early '80s, and all that meant to me was that I could get MTV. And MTV at that time was was crazy. It was music lovers making a channel that nobody believed in, and nobody knew nobody thought that music videos were making money. So it was all done in like. It was really, there were, there were experiments going on. So this was like 81, 82, mm -hmm. you know, the very early 80s. And it just exposed me to um, a lot of just different kinds of, of music, different kinds of, I started playing drums. I got a drum kit at age mm -hmm. 13 after making my own kit and, you know, forcing my parents to hear me wail on like ice cream, like big tubs of ice cream that you could get, right? We would go through, mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. I should probably admit that my family would go through tons God, of ice cream, but. But they made, you know, great. and I would assemble these into a, a rocking kit, but then eventually got my own kit. So I started playing drums and listening to that. At that time, I was into metal, and but I came from New Wave, and I still loved li listening to those soundtracks. And then I got into like um, even even heavier metal, like like thrash metal and metal. What metal? I mean, you said metal now twice. Be more yeah. specific. Tell me some okay, bands. Well, own okay, up, so own up to it. Well, well we're gonna get into this. this <laughs> awesome argument of what what is actual metal but oh, I, no, you're not going to get that argument with me i'm oh, just you no, know like, I want I, to fight. Oh. oh well we can fight I'll, I'll pretend i know what i'm talking about <laughs> oh, okay well okay so metal i'm talking about you know 1984 1985 so mm -hmm. the stuff that was going on in la and people will call it hair metal but i will fight them because at that time it was great <laughs> stuff before it became formulaic and sort of copied which is what happens things just go downhill when that's happened but at the time mm -hmm. they were all they all came from different place they, they weren't copying anything they didn't have an audience for it and just created the sound so i'm talking motley Crue mm -hmm. and rats and van halen and then i got into iron maiden and judas priest and then um eventually once you know the 87 88 when it started to become derivative i was like i'm no longer interested started getting, getting into rush 
and started getting into uh, Megadeth and Metallica and Slayer and all that stuff. Mm. And then once that started getting copied, then I got into stuff more, you know, Sonic Youth, um, mm. the Madchester scene that was going on. I was really into scenes. I was in a small town. So mm. I was like, you know, I was very isolated, but was fortunately able to, you know, there were connections through, through MTV. I was just sort of information was beamed in and I made it's, what I could of it. You know? It's interesting. Just, uh, just from a data point perspective, like I, I think about, you know, um, we were a little more cloistered off in the eighties in terms of what our, like the, the difficulty it took for an influence to seep in, like for my town, right. the, the amount of effort it took for, you know, Metallica to make it to my town is just different than the amount of effort it takes now for something to make it into a town. Um, I grew up, I played, you know, it was Metallica, Sepultura, Slayer, Pantera, Poison was a bridge too far. Although secretly, oh, yeah. well, I love Poison. You know, I wasn't. I didn't. I don't have any hate in my heart for Poison. But the band I was in was never going to play on Skinny Bob. You know, that was right. selling out. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's just, yeah. I don't know what it is about being a high school kid in maybe Ohio or you know in LA or whatever. But like, yeah, metal seems to be the. It's like the only thing. It's rebellion. It's like anger, it's and you're awesome. sort of like lost in general. Just like I have armpit hair now, and I'm feeling yeah. feelings I never thought. <laughs> and I'm just like Pantera, you know. Yeah, like, yeah, I don't, sure. I don't even it's understand like, the lyrics. I'm just sort of like yeah, anger. Yeah. Well, I would sit. I was like 14, and I would sit with those lyrics. The first time I got Master of Puppets, and sit with those lyrics, mm. and I had, you know, whatever. I'd come from what it, the stuff I was listening to before, like Guns and Roses and everything. But mm-hmm. I and Iron Maiden. Iron Maiden those lyrics are mind blowing no matter, you know, <laughs> why they, you know, even now late at night, oh shit, you know, but, yeah. um, but those, those lyrics in Metallica, like reading those lyrics, everything about it was just, it took me mm-hmm. down a different portal. Mm-hmm. It was a way to engage my brain very differently. And it was like very much about rage and like, yeah, just, just, it was okay to just be loud and, and rock out. And, uh, you know, <laughs> well, as a drummer, like, as a drummer listening to this stuff, you said you got your first, how old were you when you first got your drum set? I was 13. You were 13. So, and were you listening, was it metal drumming that was sort of influencing you or, or were you, were there other styles of drumming that were seeping in that were sort of, uh, I mean, for me, I learned to play drums by playing along to Metallica. I also learned by Weezer and Pearl Jam. So I, it wasn't a like clean line for me in terms right. of what I was listening to, but yeah. um, what, who were you listening to as a drummer where you were like, whoa, that's awesome. Yeah, I was at age 13. I was definitely listening to, uh, well, Tommy Lee from Motley Crue. I was listening to Lars Ulrich mm-hmm. in Metallica. I was also like really a big, a big Stuart Copeland fan. I, mm. I, I loved all the... I, even like Roger Taylor from Duran Duran, because I was a big mm. Duran Duran fan earlier, and all mm. that stuff started to make sense. I would go back to that music because I'd listened to it so much, but listening to it as a drummer was very different. And mm. started getting into Led Zeppelin a little bit later, and yeah. you know, yeah, uh, even the Beatles. Listening to those 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 drum parts, listening to a Beatles track when you're ten, and just listening to the whole thing, and then starting to separate it as you learn. I started learning guitar, got a guitar at sixteen. So then mm. I started re-listening to all this stuff and listening differently each time Mm -hmm. and learning you know learning parts Uh, rush was a big big fan i started learning drums neil purple was a big uh influence and i tried you know those early Beatles, Beatles rec- I mean, I think there's a now remixes where you can just listen to the mono recordings and then you can yeah. listen to the studio versions. And it's like, you could really learn the guitar part because you could just pan everything left and only hear the guitar, you know, like, or, you, or yeah. you pan everything right and it's just Ringo, you know. Um, uh, but well, so for you, as you were listening, though, what I, I mean, I when I think of like if somebody says like, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you say Nicole Lise, I say DJ really quick, like when and that does that's not proof that that's true that's just what comes to mind for me because that's how i was introduced to you other than right. your your composition side um and i think i learned about you being a drummer after you after i learned about you being a dj and a composer okay. so that just in terms of my perception of reality knowing yeah. that that's not always true in fact it rarely is true um <laughs> uh when did the when did sort of djing and well actually let me ask when did djing and composing come into your life and how i mean because being a drummer is one thing i i'm a drummer i know what that's like but composition just never crossed my field of vision as like yeah i want to do that like it just never yeah. was a thing yeah i know yeah so the the dj actually the the turntables and stuff came before in a weird way because it's tied into the machines that my mm. dad and many of those were turntables and I would use those as well, make sounds from turntables without knowing what was going on 
at the time. I, mm. You know, not in the same way. I was I didn't have a crossfader, so I didn't have the same equipment. But I had a turntable and a record, and mm. would make these you know scratches and 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 sounds between and record them onto like a, a boombox and stop them and start them and slow. So that that sort of happened there, and then I started hearing about. Um, turntables and it was coming out of new york city in the, mm-hmm. in the late 70s i remember seeing a special on it and thought, this is incredible and um that was then i was yeah that sort of started things even at that young age even though i didn't have the equipment but i had my dad's proper working stereo equipment that could i could use the volume knob in, in much the same mm-hmm. way but i didn't have a crossword but so the, D, the dj stuff didn't really develop into something that i could that was uh really progress at it beyond that sort of those sort of malfunction years yeah. until uh probably my early 20s and i started i always knew i wanted to write i wanted i felt turntables and a dj belonged completely in concert music and the composition thing you know sort of happened i just wait so you felt wait sorry i didn't you felt that way yeah but was that be, were was was that a feeling that you just naturally had and got no pushback on, or did you feel that way yeah. because somebody told you early on like this is never going to happen, and you were just like, well, screw you, I'm going to do it. No, no, all of the pushback was, you know, the pushback in in small town was pretty, you know, constant in many ways. I mean, I was like a girl drummer, mm-hmm. I was into metal, I was into skateboarding for a while, you know, all these things. So, and then in, in the turntables, and nobody knew. What, that was never mainstream at the time, not mm-hmm. till much, much later, even, you know, like well later. Um, so I always, but I always, all these machines that included turntables, I always, they never went away. I would, I still have a lot of them. My, my dad never threw them out. Mm-hmm. I accumulated them. And always, as I was, you know, while I was growing up, of course, I, threw, I listened and played piano and listened to classical music. But for me, all these sounds just belong together. And so when I started writing, writing notes down, um, I, I just wanted these, these sort of sounds to, to belong together, to, to mm. melt. And it just seemed, it was a very organic kind of development. Well, how, how did you, as a, just as a composer, I mean, this is something that, you know, I have enough insecurity and anxiety when somebody asked me to improvise and that's like, you know, I had a good discussion with a friend of mine, Jank Ergun, and we were talking about improvising versus composing and how they're like two different things and never it, as far as he's concerned never the two should cross you know okay um not saying that's that's not my view either that's not my view but we it was a great discussion but when i'm asked to improvise i feel like i'm being asked to create and that's a whole load of anxiety and baggage i just quite frankly at 40 i'm I've, i'm more comfortable saying like nope <laughs> talk to somebody <laughs> else like i yeah. don't have the time to deal with that yeah um so but as a composer like it's a similar mindset. I imagine like you write something, it's yours, you've thought about it and then you give it to somebody else and then they have to make, they have to make it come to life. What was the first experience for you where you had, like, when was that for you where you made something and you didn't know what it was going to sound like until you handed it to somebody? Oh, that would have happened. I guess that would have happened. Uh, anything I wrote, I would play myself or record straight to cassette or mm. make these mm. albums and, you know, and then, so, uh, undergrad, I guess, uh, wrote a string quartet. I think that was my first, my first piece was a string quartet or, or maybe a, a violin and piano do around the same time. I just decided I'm going to, you know, I went in, when I went into my undergrad, there was no composition. Where was this at again? Remind me. This was in Brandon, Manitoba, Brandon University. So okay. in, in Manitoba. So one province over from where I, I grew up, okay. there was nothing. And I had sent in my, my audition tape was both piano and I had sent in a bunch of my, my compositions that I had mm. done in my, my, you know, cassette, um, extravaganzas and stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, drums and everything. Um, and then there was nothing. So I had to wait a couple of years. So I studied piano. I did piano, uh, performance there, or mm. piano as a major. And so, you know, third year composition, um, is, is an option. So I had, I, I started, uh, writing, you know, started writing, and and going to composition classes that were suddenly that were suddenly available. So that would have been the first time. And I can't, you know, the, the the I guess my reaction was I don't know. That's it's so crazy talking about that. It's like, that's so 
that was such a long time. It ago. must have gone well enough that you continued to do it. Well, I, I you know, so. like I guess yeah, that's my yeah, question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't. I, it's crazy. You're asking this. I don't remember. Uh, I think. I think. Yeah. I think it was. Uh, you know. I think at that time I do remember thinking, "Holy shit, composition's in. We can do this. You know, mm. it's okay now." And uh, just sort of diving into it and doing and just sort of putting blinders on and doing my thing. So, well, yeah. can you talk a little bit about just um, you know, you're you are a performer. You, I mean, you you uh, and by and large, I would say, you know, a DJ is. Uh, predominantly a solo life, um, unless there's DJ ensembles I'm not aware of, and I'm not going to assume that there's not. But um, how has your art making just personally um, changed in your work with other human beings? I know, like, you know, being in the room with us uh, and hearing stuff come to life. You know, when you worked with us, it wasn't your, this, this was not your first rodeo. You had, you know, it's like you knew how things were going to work by and large. But how how did you how do you sorry I don't know how to ask the question how do you make compromises in your own art when you're working with human beings um, who are in the room that maybe don't you know maybe it's, I don't know like I don't I, I, there's not a clear question here Nikki I, I apologize but I guess how how do you work with other people and make your your music that in your head is perfect and makes sense and then you you put it in in, in humans hands and all of a sudden you have to compromise or make decisions how do you personally approach that when you're walking in the room yeah well, that's a great question and 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 a multifaceted one because it wasn't a it was de- definitely um a, a process uh in that not that I, I think i can say from the from the very start uh my sort of perception of what composition was 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 maybe not and i knew this i mean the feedback you know i'm thinking because of your question earlier now i'm thinking those what happened those days but i do remember i had ideas and they weren't necessarily uh normal ideas for an institution for an undergrad i just need to let my i need to let my dog in real quick she's it's storming it's it's storming here and she's freaking out like i told you a second give me one second sorry (laughs) Okay, here we are. <laughs> all right, we're all safe inside the yeah. office. Go ahead. Is, is, your, is he, she okay? Is everything... Oh, yeah, they're both fine. They just... Um, okay. Anya is... Uh, Sasha's under my desk right now, and okay. uh, so I've been petting her this whole time. She's the one that freaks out. <laughs> Anya Anya's more of the, like, I'm so worried about Sasha. That's, like, where her anxiety comes. Aww. So Anya is just sort of in the room making sure Aww. everybody's okay. But um, I had no idea that was going on. That's like drama going on in the <laughs> trying, so. trying to hide my drama below the Zoom the drama. window here. Yeah. <laughs> Continue. Sorry about that. Yeah. So um, from the very beginning, my ideas for what constituted composition was very different. I did want drum kits in there. I did mm. want tur- turntables in there. And I met with some resistance from, from, a ver- from very early on. And, you know, I'm asked this, how did you, because I went to McGill after and did a, my thesis was a turntable concerto. And that was, mm-hmm. it sort of divided the faculty. They, you know, part of the faculty thought, yeah, this is, you know, this is, I devised a notation and this is what um, contemporary music should be moving forward. And I certainly felt that, um, but there was, of course, members of faculty who felt it was not serious music. This is, you know, just frowned upon, just frowned upon. Um, but I did it and I was able to put blinders on um, throughout actually my, my life, not to get overly, you know, dramatic, but, mm-hmm. it, but it's the only way to, to explain how it is, you know, the chamber music with turntables, chamber music with malfunctioning instruments. Uh, yeah, there was, there was definite, you know, having a conductor conduct uh, a turntablist and while knowing, trying to explain that, you know, it's they're feeding off each other because of the record also has innate tempos in there. And so there has to be a back and forth, which makes it, gives it its magic, right? For me, that's, that's mm-hmm. the most interesting part. Some things are going to be slightly slower. I'm going to yeah. write that in the score. I mean, we're going to be, we're going to be record juggling. That's going to be written in the score and the tempos are going to be slightly, there's not going to be something, uh, it's not going to make sense. I'm not going to writ to that, or it's not going to be gradual. It's going to be immediate. Mm-hmm. And so I think with all of this, I just had to stand, and, and I remember people call, you know, at the very beginning calling me and saying, this is, this is impossible, this drum part is impossible, or whatever. And I, I learned to just say, 
I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to change it. And that happened years and years ago. And then they would, I would hear back from them like, yeah, I just, it's, it's, you know, it's not impossible. Yeah. It's just different. It's not drum, like just like, you know, yeah. keeping time. It's not, you're, you, you know, I love that. You know, I understand and appreciate the history of drum and its function, but that's not what I, what I wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think once that sort of, you know, was understood, I just had to keep doing that. And because I had ideas and that's all that, that's all, it has to be meaningful for me to go through that much work. That's all, you know, so I really had to just keep my, um, the blinders on and, and keep going. So in things like situations, like when you, you know, um, playing with people, the play, the performing with people actually um, happened a little bit later. People would ask me uh, to perform with them. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's an interesting, that's a sort of an interesting dimension to live performance and composition as well, because mm -hmm. I have to prepare my own part and mm -hmm. I have to learn it. You know, I have to send that part to me and I have to learn it. And it's interesting. I do, I, I do it quite often now, like a lot where I play, perform in my own band and my own pieces and, and that sort of thing. And it just, it's a, it's a cool way of many things, cool way of, of achieving that, that goal with, everybody on stage it's mm -hmm. different when you're out in the in the audience it's not better yeah. or worse it's just very different where yeah, you're yeah. there in the greater for the greater good of, of trying to make this happen and you enter in a dimension with everybody and there's this it's a whole other universe and and sometimes you know I'll, trying to articulate that with people what we've just been through because I've, often i'll do especially you know in recent years um multimedia shows where that last 90 minutes, some of them, and we go through this. I mean, there's breaks and things, it's mm -hmm. very calculated, but it's, you know, it's an adventure and we'll get to I, the end of that. We've all been through something. And, you know, it's, there's something about being in the audience and, and experiencing that. You as know, the you, but, you're in, you're in the sort of like when I, uh, the way I build respect with people or the, the way I respect people or the way people build trust with me, you know, it's different person to person, but by and large, like you can build trust and respect with me really quickly if you're willing to take ownership of stuff with me. Like, I'm not asking you to take complete ownership, but just get up here and take the punches with me. And like, you're one of those people, Caroline Shaw, Dan Truman, Steve Reich. Like, these are all people who yeah. are willing to get up and be like, well, I wrote this crazy thing. Uh, yeah. You know, I'm going to play with now. You know, maybe you're not a performer as a composer, but I wonder if there should be like a rule that we pass that's like. Um, if you, if it's the world premiere of your work, you at least have to sit on a chair on stage. Oh man. Like just, That's, you, you have yeah. to just sit there with your hands on your lap yeah, and, yeah. And, and deal with the, the consequences too. Like you can't hide in the 53rd row and wait yeah. for your bow. Like that's not the, that's not the agreement we are going to have. Yeah. Um, I just wonder how much respect between players and composers would just skyrocket because of just the simple, like shared experience of that horrifying feeling of it, presenting a work yeah. that is brand new, you know, yeah. even when and it goes it, well. It really is. And I'll, I'll say, I continue, I, you know, and again, it's just for myself, putting myself in those positions, which I firmly believe in. Um, and I'll say to myself, I've, you know, I've been there when I first did a, a, a notated, just precise DJ, you know, parts that I was like, what the, what the hell am I doing? What am I thinking? You know, and every, you know, like there's, you know, and, but, that is what it's all about putting going those positions putting myself in those positions with everyone and and going through that experience and coming out and it it, it, it again hard to articulate just what goes um what goes into that to prepare mm -hmm. is you know is 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 something to be it's a journey it's but i fully believe in it even when i first started doing multimedia i'm not trained in in i'm not a, I, I taught everything self-taught in all the film I do but it films uh shooting editing everything yeah. and just decided uh there's a big show coming this was like in the early 2000s oh I'm, I'm going to um it's gonna be multimedia I'll do it and I just immersed myself sleepless nights of course pains it's painful and but that's like that is under getting deep into something and that's mm -hmm. something you know that makes it it go it gets into a place in your head that not to get all, you know, no. <laughs> I have a little bit quarantine brain. So, you know, we're, I listen, getting... we're all traumatized with this quarantine. So yeah. no, no judgment on this so, end in terms of where you, how yeah. your brain's working. 
Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't even know what I've asked you this at this point. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember anything I've said. So you okay. ask me these questions. Um, yeah. So it's just, it's just, that's what makes it worthwhile doing these, yeah. you know, why would I go through, you go through the pain in the nineties of putting a turntables together with a classical orchestra because it's, I, it's worth it. it you know, it's, it's emotions or it's, 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 universes that I want to go to. And I, and I think that way writing those things, but I also think that way playing those things, going through an experience that would change, that will change. I think art or music is like that is I don't, it may sound a little, I don't know, sappy or whatever. And Mm -hmm. maybe I'll get my ass kicked, (laughs) but it's, you know, whatever. No, I'm joking. Um, I, I think mean, getting, I want to go back to my small town. But. Getting as close to whatever experience. I mean, I think the level of respect you have for something, uh, the potential for that it, that respect to go to go up, increases the closer you get to the actual thing that it is that you're influenced by. So, like, if you love chamber music, that's awesome. Like, go to a concert. Like, ask yourself, how do you feel about the New York Philadelphia or the sorry, the New York Philharmonic uh, um, Philharmonic? Sorry, yeah. I see quarantine brain. Yeah. No, um, how do you feel about the New York Phil? Oh, they're great. Cool. I've only been to one show and I sat in the 103rd row. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to bump you up to the 50th row. Now what do you think? Okay, it was, that was cool. It was louder. You know, it was awesome. We're going to put you in the front row. Holy smokes, that is crazy. How loud. Okay, now we're going to put you on stage right by the Mahler yeah. hammer. And yeah. when that thing hits yeah. and the organ <laughs> comes in, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Like, all of a sudden, it's not that you, th- you, you know, you, that you think like – the Mahler hammer player should all of a sudden be an essential worker during a pandemic lockdown. But your respect for that music is always like, Oh, okay. Like, okay. It's a different thing. I didn't realize that, you know, it's so true. It just, yeah, it's definitely, yeah. Breaking the, the, like the fourth wall in many ways, you know, like you just went and, and that's, that's every, that's everything. I mean, one of the things, just a, a little note, when I, when I, I decided when I was my undergrad, now I didn't play percussion, I played drums but I decided to play um, orchestral percussion. And they gave me and my friend, who's a p- also a pianist, the, the, the part. So we got all these orchestral parts. I'd never played, I've never seen a part before. I don't know what counting measures is. I don't know anything, mm-hmm. but we did it. And I'm sitting back there with all these instruments I've never seen before, learning how to play them. Like I went and scrambled and learned how to play this shit. Yeah. And I'm like, this is the best. I've never, I don't, I've never seen this before in my life. And it's incredible to be behind the brass and they're counting measures and I'm counting measures and waiting, you know, waiting for cues and playing, cra- like playing crash cymbals in the middle of a, a Shostakovich symphony, like one note. And that's, it's a crazy thing, but that's like an experience that, and, and I'm, you know, screwed up, screwed up a lot because I couldn't, but I learned like a ton of stuff, but it's a perspective. I saw music differently. And I heard music differently. Hmm. And had and and formed this uh, bond with the musicians that was way different, but for sure informed, definitely informed my my way going forward. The the, the experience in that scenario that is one of a kind in an orchestra, in an ensemble, or on stage with you guys mm-hmm. when you're all set up, and I'm there and I'm looking, <laughs> oh shit, why is you know I, why do I continue to use this machine that breaks down fifty percent of the mm-hmm. time? But it's working today. It's all, it's all, you know, and seeing all you guys, it, it's, it's, it's magical. It's like, why it's do just, I continue to ask the percussionists to get typewriters that consistently jam <laughs> <laughs> and ask them to play fast rhythms on them? Sometimes it won't jam. And then they, it, it, you guys play them fast. And it's like, that's just so, that's the shit. Uh, it's, so, it, it's, yeah, it's adrenaline. It's highs and it's going, yeah, it's just going to that other place. Well, can, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, when you talk about your writing and it, the initial pushback you got from, oh, this is too hard or whatever. Um, I mean, I think I, 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 it would be disingenuous of me to not, st- or to say that I didn't have a same instinct when I get, when I get your music, I'm like, oh my God, there's so many notes. Like, but again, like I have to work through my, like my feelings about this aren't proof of anything just because it, I feel like this is hard. That doesn't mean it's hard. So like, what is this? When you zoom in on your music, I feel like, um, and again, this is a broad brush, Nikki, so slap me hard if you, if you disagree here, um, that loops are a fundament, one of the fundamental tools by which you build things. Um, um, taking some sort of pattern, no matter how, how much minutia is in that pattern, you can always keep zooming out further before, and then you'll eventually find the loop. You know what I mean? Like your drum set writing, you can look at three beats and be like, there's nothing that repeats. And you got to keep, oh, it's a nine beat phrase. And then this other one's like, oh my God, that's a 24 beat loop or whatever. Um, 
and it's really helped me learn your music and be less afraid of it. Uh, I guess my question is, is that true? Am I anywhere remotely in the ballpark? And if so, um, can you just talk about that for a second? Loops. I mean, because I've heard some people be like, if you loop anything, that means you don't have an original idea. So, uh, really? you know, it's like, well, I, I mean, I've heard people say it. Composition okay. teachers have said it. Um, and it is a thing. It's like, you should never repeat a bar, you know. Right, um, right. But I'm not asking you to defend your position here. But just like, why, why is loops important to you? Are loops important to you? And if so, why? Wow. Um, first of all, there are no loops in my music. And I, I, I'm constantly wondering why you keep looping, playing the same thing over and over in every performance. You know, I'm just, I'm oh my, okay. Oh, Nikki. Oh, Nikki. Oh. Hey, joke. I've been in a quarantine. I'm too weak for this, Nikki. You can't say that. That's, that's, that's all I got, man. Loop, loop joke. Um, that's a funny thing because I remember this coming up like there was some sort of thing... Uh, article or it was before blog so this was in the 90s mm. when there was the argument that everything new music um especially certain client in, in academia mm -hmm. where it, everything had to be true composed which right. got to you know you, you don't repeat anything and then there was a this was so long ago but i remember there was an argument as well i mean you go back to you go back to the beginning of music and, and repetition is a is a is a is a is a, is a skill knowing how to repeat something when to repeat and make, you know i think that the simply i have a bit of a problem calling uh leaving music either through composed and 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 composers have said this i i there are no melodies in my music i don't compose i i don't i don't uh, repeat anything you know but that years and years ago so i'm trying to to, to sort of zoom in on this again mm -hmm. but but going from that to minimalism which some people can just reduce to being oh it's just repetition over and over, which I, I i don't agree with that either i don't think music i don't also think music or any art can be reduced well it's, but this is especially true of music where it can be sort of reduced to easy hard or well, but or it's like it's like it's like saying like i mean it's a little bit like if you're if you like cooking and you're like well, I love making um, a really complicated soup because there's all these ingredients I like to marry, but I hate making whipped cream because that's just boring. It's like, well, hold up a second. Like, wait a minute. What you're saying is boring because you hate doing this over and over again, but you see what you make with it? Like, yeah. Like exactly. you made something exactly. rad that wasn't existing before. And that's like when I hear people bag on Steve Reich as being like, or Lamont Young or Terry Wright, it's like, this is the same thing over. So hold up a second. No, you're right. Absolutely. Yeah. You've hit the nail on the head, except yeah, look at this exactly. crazy whipped cream that Steve Reich made that wasn't there before, <laughs> you know? like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it, there's so much to say about that. And I want, I want to be able to articulate using my, my, my pandemic, my, my brain here, but because there's so many, yeah, I do, I do repeat, but uh, I don't repeat for the sake of repeating. It's not because, um, I have nothing else. <laughs> I can't think of anything. Well, else. they're not they're not easily well, perceivable loops. I guess is my well, point. Like you have to yeah. look a little harder I, from a well, performer I, yeah. standpoint. I feel like I've had to do that, you know. But they're I there. Think, yeah, I think when what the, the discussion, the argument for repetition, first of all, has to begin with what is chosen to be repeated. What goes into mm. that material? And I'll tell you a great deal. You know, when writing a a, a drum uh, drum material. Uh, I do want it to be to be interesting for me. I want it to be interesting for the players. I want it to reflect how I feel, what drums, what the, the place of drums in chamber in chamber music, mm -hmm. um, where it's lost in its its cliche function. Well, cliche is a pejorative, not a cliche, but what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah. So I want to find a you know, I want to find a place for that, but no, more more so a place for that material in fully integrated with what who, who else is on stage it's not just random you know there's this going on there's this but there's also mm -hmm. this and the way it's repeated i will you know there's a there's a reason for repetition i mean why did any composer choose to you know repeat the the theme or what is it what is it for and in any in any form of art in film as well i mean i think of, of film why bring back you know characters what does it do to the what does it do and it, it's it just it it's essential. It's hard to pinpoint exactly, mm -hmm. but it's it's essential in building uh, for me. And not to say that I, I mean I have 
I have written some, something that I could, I could consider to be composed. And it's, it is what it is, but it's not really an either or. It, my choosing to repeat something is, is for it to sort of travel, to get somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, because what is bookended? What is it surrounded by? What somebody is perhaps um, repeating but somebody is not, somebody's, you know, so there's this, what is happening over top? What is sort of superimposed over top of this? For, mm -hmm. So for example, white label experiment where you guys are repeating, but there's, you're out of, I'm in, using interlocked records and they also repeat, right? That's the epitome of repeating because it's over and over and over. But the whole experience as a whole, we have to stand back and, and um, zoom out and realize that you guys are, one record, you guys are forming one record, or three of you are, and one of you is yet another record that's out of sync. You guys are focusing, you know, to, to stay in, in to stay together. Somebody else is fitting over top of that, and I'm completely out with you, but in with myself. That sort mm -hmm. of thing. And so it's you know these these. I think it's a bigger picture than saying music repeats or doesn't repeat because it's there's more you know what yeah. is its overall function? Where does it travel to? What is the the, the linear fun where does yeah where do you arrive and do you arrive at a place because of what just happened I mean it's mm -hmm. not just the same thing from beginning to end it 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 paints it's like a painting a, a, a it's like a there's like, it's like a portal portal yeah that serves as a I mean your portal is there and you want to enjoy you what know, you want to enjoy the portal the portal has something in it but you are the portal is a, a place to another you know a, a way to travel to somewhere else mm -hmm. and because you went through that portal you've arrived at this this place so they all mm -hmm. sort of impact each other i think it, it it uh you know i i don't i've been thinking a long time about sort of this this sort of thing too and it, and it I'm, I'm not saying i've what where i'm at now is the solution but it feels like i like to think of it as like narrative momentum like the way yeah. of, there's inevitability that if a composer can build in repetition in a way that is just thoughtful enough and then if the performer can realize that repetition in such a way that the inevitability is inherent in that i mean because you know you can you can build in all of the build up all you want but if i just take it i'm just like oh it's boring and then i just sort of like oh, phone yeah. it phone it in then then the, the momentum is lost um and i think too it's like if you've got a, i feel like your music is like yes there's little moments of like if you zoom in, there's a million different things that are constantly looping. But when you step out and you look at, if you just stopped at any moment and we're like, okay, cool, this is where everything lines up. And then you just press play again, everything's looping and you press stop again, boom. Nothing in that second cross section is going to be the same as the one prior. So no. therefore, you're not repeating. Yeah. Like nothing is repeating. And that's like, that is some sort of macro, like, you know, it's a very meta, like you're sort of more meta than meta when you step back and zoom out that like, yes, your whole thing is made up of repeating loops, except nothing's actually repeating on the grand scale, which is yeah. kind of awesome. And I mean, white label experiment, you mentioned this, like there's two drum set parts that have these loops that are cycling around a million times. You have, I'm playing a record that I don't know if you pre, I don't think you predetermine what record or you had some recommendations maybe. No, it was all, oh, the one that you play. Yeah. I left that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I left that one. Right. And I think originally it was the Wilhelm Scream by yeah. uh, James yeah. Blake. It was. But I don't remember. Maybe it was Brahms the last time we hung out. I can't remember what, which record it ended up being. <laughs> but, right. You know. I, you know. <laughs> but it is this thing that I think the ecosystem, like you build, you're really good at building an ecosystem within a piece where there is like this neighborhood of instruments that just like to take it back to your dad, like this, like there's this ecosystem of things that are constantly malfunctioning <laughs> yet. Yeah. It's their, their, their coinciding malfunctions that sort of allow the thing to propel itself forward. I don't, that's the worst way to describe it. Um, no, it isn't at all. I mean, it makes total sense because I, yeah, or I've described it actually before as like gears and pulleys. When you look, when mm. you open up, it's actually go looking because I've, Again, growing up, I grew up around, and I have some new books and books of schematics and insides of televisions and looking mm. at them. They were, the innards were all over the place, always, because my dad would fix, fix these. So I'd see these devices that I'm used to, you know, seeing them face forward as a consumer should. But then seeing them with their innards spilled out is beautiful. It's just gorgeous, all these schematics and the way. 
And that's what is necessary to make the narrative on the front, what you're experiencing is all mm. of this. And there's, the, you know, repetition, like, you know, there's things repeat. You have a, you know, things look a certain way. There's a, there's a, a series of, of connections that repeat for a while. And then and it's necessary for, for its function. And then, you know, it slowly goes into a, a different, a, another pattern, another, you know, so I look at it as the innards or what's necessary. It, and it's, it's completely referencing what you just said. I feel, yeah, poor dad. Like, I feel like, you know, if your dad, I wish parents could have the, like, you know, the foresight to be like, uh, Hey kid, I brought home all this weird stuff. And you were like, daddy, am I going to write music that no one's going to understand later? And I'm going to get pushed back on because of that, because of all these schematics. And if he could just tap, pat you know, they had to be like, yes, honey, but you'll be okay. Like, 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 Absolutely. <laughs> it's just such a weird sort of like dot to connect to be like, Oh my God, yeah. your music is making so much sense to me knowing that you grew up looking at the insides of TVs, you know, <laughs> I'm revealing truth. I'm revealing so much. I've said too much. This no, it's so great. Bad. It's, it's, yeah, no, this is, I wish we had started here. I think, yeah, I, I think, well. you know, um, we may not, not that I misunderstood you at all, but it's like, I feel like these, we would have had this conversation six years ago or seven years ago, whenever it was that we first yeah, yeah, met. Yeah. I, um, it's really this has been helpful, Nikki. I really appreciate you sort oh, of I'm glad doing happy. a deep, deep dive here. Um, cool. You have, you have some illegal fireworks to get to. So I'll, I'll, I want to, yeah, I want to, oh, yeah. I, okay. I want to get, was like, I know 46 minutes and it's just gone. Um, yeah. I will say one of the things that um, I, I want to advocate for people, if you ever feel like you couldn't sit down and turn your phone off and have a conversation unscripted for an hour, I think you'd be surprised at how quickly an hour goes by. Um, I think I highly recommend that everybody in the world at least take some chunk of your week and just put your phone down and talk because time flies. Um, yeah. Well, Nikki, this has been awesome. I really, I mean, there's no way in 47 minutes that we're going to, we're going to hit everything that is important in your life and what it is you're working on. But so I just want to tell you the door is open. Um, I, you know, I will do my best to reach out and invite you back on. But if you've got something you want to talk about or a project you're working on, or you just want to sit and stare at each other for 47 minutes, happy to do it. You know where to find me. Um, but where can folks learn more? Like if, if somebody's listening to this and is like, oh man, I had no idea Nikki Lise even was a thing. What, where could they find more out about you and sort of what, what you're working on and, and your works and things like that? Well, there is, uh, there's a, there are several things on YouTube, you know, I, so type in took my name some stuff you guys show up there and like to, yeah there's a lot of things there i have a website and uh, with some link yeah so, so there's some it's a little outdated currently but um yeah audio visual stuff um so just on the interwebs is the way to is it uh, nikki lise nicole lise .com or yeah that i should provide that information yes nicole lise .com. yes okay. so um, n-i-c-o-l-e l-i-z L I Z E dot com. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, enjoy your freedom today, Nikki. Yeah. You go celebrate. Thanks. You go celebrate and, and do it upright. Um, and I, I'm very grateful for your time. I really, really appreciate it. I learned more than I thought I was going to learn about, about you and your music, and that's why I do this. So thank you for that. I really, really am grateful. Oh, it's my pleasure. I loved it. This was so great, and I would absolutely get to Whoa. Oh, my. All right. I think Mama's home, so... um. Yeah. yeah, I think mommy's home, so now they're feeling a little rambunctious. So, Nikki, All right. thank you for your time. Be safe, be well, and we'll talk soon, okay? Thank you, Josh. Take care. All right, see you. Bye. Bye. You enjoyed that conversation. This podcast was brought to you by Liquid Drum, L I Q U I D R U M dot com, down in Waco, Texas. Hilarious percussion videos, good pedagogy, and, and fun merch. Check them out, liquiddrum.com. DunleavyPans.com, D U N L E A V Y Pans.com. Kyle makes and builds all the steel drums that I tune or that I perform and teach on. Uh, and he'll hook you up too. Check him out, DunleavyPans.com. And finally, my good friend Kendall Williams, Jerry Guy, Trisha Guy, Arisha John, amongst many others, run an organization called Pan in Motion. Uh, you can check them out at paninmotion.com. Okay, hope you're well. Hope you are all well. We'll talk to you soon.